February 5, 1900, Volume 3, The Circle of Truth of the Knowledge of Self. Continuing in the same state, with a little bit more courage, though I was not perfectly free, my dearest Jesus on coming told me, My daughter, sometimes the soul feels an encounter in some virtue, and plucking up her strength, the soul overcomes that encounter. And then that virtue becomes more resplendent and rooted in the soul. However, the soul must be very attentive in order to avoid that she herself might provide the little rope to let herself be bound by lack of confidence. And she will do this by always restricting herself within the circle of truth, without ever leaving it, which is the knowledge of her nothingness. February 5th. 1901, Volume 4. She encounters two maidens who serve justice, tolerance and dissimulation. This morning, blessed Jesus transported me outside of myself, but he made himself seen in a state that moved even the stones to pity. Oh, how he suffered. It seemed that, unable to endure any more, he wanted to unload himself a little, almost asking for help. I felt my poor heart split with tenderness, and immediately I pulled the crown of thorns from him, putting it on myself so as to give him relief. And then I said to him, My sweet good, you have not renewed in me the pains of the cross for some time. I pray you to renew them today, so you will be more relieved. And he, My beloved, it is necessary to ask justice in order to do this because things have reached such a point that it can no longer permit that you suffer. I did not know what to do in order to ask justice, when two maidens came up to me, who seemed to be serving justice. One had the name of Tolerance, the other Dissimulation. As I asked them to crucify me, Tolerance took one of my hands and nailed it, but without wanting to finish. So I said, O oh, holy dissimulation, complete my crucifixion. Don't you see that tolerance has left me? Show yourself how much better you are in dissimulating. So she completed my crucifixion, but with such spasm that if the Lord had not sustained me in his arms, I would certainly have died for the pain. After this, blessed Jesus added, Daughter, it is necessary that you suffer these pains at least sometimes. And if it were not so, woe to the world. What would become of it? Then I prayed to him for various people, and I found myself inside myself. February 5th, 1913, Volume 11 One who does not do the divine will does not have right to anything. She is an intruder and a thief of the things of God. Difference between divine will and love. This morning my always adorable Jesus came like shadow and lightning and told me, My daughter, one who does not do my will, has no reason to live on earth. Her life becomes without purpose, with no means and with no end. She is just like a tree which is incapable of producing any fruit. At the most it can produce poisonous fruits, with which it poisons itself more and more, as well as anyone who would imprudently eat them. This tree does nothing other than steal the poor hard work of the farmer, who hoes the soil around it with hardship and sweat. In the same way, the soul who does not do my will is in continuous act of defrauding me, converting those thefts into poison. She is around me to steal from me. She steals from me the work of creation, the work of her own redemption and sanctification. She steals from me the light of the sun, the food she takes, the air she breathes, the water which quenches her thirst, the fire which warms her, and the ground she treads because all this belongs to the one who does my will. All that is mine is hers, too. On the other hand, one who does not do my will has no rights. 
so I feel as if being continuously robbed. One who does not do my will has to be held as a noxious and fraudulent stranger. Therefore it is necessary to chain her and throw her into the deepest prisons. Having said this, he disappeared like a flash. Another day he came and told me, My daughter, do you want to know the difference between my will and love? My will is sun. Love is fire. My will, like the sun, does not need food, nor does its light and heat grow or decrease. It remains always equal to itself, and its light always most pure. On the other hand, the fire, which symbolizes love, needs wood in order to be fed, and if the wood is missing, it can even be extinguished. It grows and decreases according to the wood that is placed in it, therefore it is subject to instability, and its light is gloomy, mixed with smoke, if love is not regulated by my will. After he said this, he disappeared. A light remained in my mind through which I could understand that the will of God is like a sun for the soul, because the actions that are done as actions wanted by God form one single thing with the divine will. And there it is. The sun is formed. The human actions and the soul's entire being united to the divine action and being are the wood which feeds this sun therefore the soul herself becomes the wood provided by the divine will but this wood is not like the wood which feeds love it cannot be lacking this sun has no need for food it does not grow or decrease it is always equal to itself its light is most pure because it takes part in everything. The divine being and the divine wood are never extinguished and are not subject to smoke. I won't explain further because I think that the rest regarding love can be understood by itself. February 5th, 1916, Volume 11 chastisements to the world and great trials for the few good. Only faithfulness will save them. I continue in my afflicted days, especially for the almost continuous threats of Jesus, that chastisements will spread more. Last night, then, I remained terrorized. I found myself out of myself, and I found my afflicted Jesus. I felt reborn to new life in finding him. But no, as I was about to console him, some people snatched him from me and reduced him to pieces. What heartbreak! What fright! I threw myself on the ground close to one of those pieces, and a voice from heaven resounded in that place. Firmness! Courage to the few good! May they not move in anything. May they not neglect anything. They will be exposed to great trials, both from God and from men. Only through faithfulness will they not stagger and be saved. The earth will be covered with unseen scourges. Creatures will try to destroy the Creator, to have their own God, and to satisfy their whims at the cost of any slaughter. And with all this, not attaining their own purposes, they will arrive at the most awful brutalities. Everything will be terror and fright. After this I found myself inside myself. I was shaking. The thought of how they had reduced my beloved Jesus gave me death. I wanted to see him at any cost, even for one instant, to see what had happened to him. And Jesus, always good, came, and I calmed down. 
may he be always blessed. February 5th, 1924, Volume 16. The soul cannot go out of the divine will because her will is chained to the immutability of the divine. Effects of Melancholy and of Cheerfulness I felt embittered because of the privation of my highest and only good. Even more, I felt that everything was over for me, and that the one who is all my life was to come no more, and that all the past had been a game of fantasy. Oh, had it been in my power, I would have burned up all the writings, so that no trace might be left about me. My nature also felt the painful effects of this, but it is useless to say on paper what I went through, because the paper, too, cruel, has not a word of comfort for me, and does not give me the one whom I so much long for. On the contrary, by saying it, it makes my pains more bitter. Therefore I move on. So while I was in such a hard state, my always lovable Jesus made himself seen to me with a stick of fire in his hand, telling me, My daughter, where do you want me to beat you with this stick? I want to strike the world, therefore I have come to you, to see how many blows you want to receive yourself, so as to give the rest to creatures. So tell me where you want me to beat you. And I, embittered as I was, said, Beat me wherever you want to beat me. I don't want to know anything. I want nothing but your will. And he again, I want to know from you where you want me to beat you. And I, no, no, I will never say that. I want there where you want. Jesus returned to ask me again, and seeing that I kept answering, I want nothing but your will, he repeated, so you don't even want to say where you want me to beat you. Then without saying anything else, he beat me. Those blows were painful, but since they were coming from the hands of Jesus, they infused in me life, strength, trust. After he struck me in such a way that I felt all beaten up, I clung to his neck, and drawing near his mouth I tried to suckle. But as I did so, a most sweet liquid came into my mouth, which cheered me all up. But this was not my will. Rather, I wanted his bitternesses, for he had so many in his most holy heart. Then I said to him, My love, what a hard lot mine is. Your privation kills me. The fear that I might go out of your will crushes me. Tell me, where have I offended you? Why do you leave me? And even though you are with me now, it does not seem to me that you have come to stay with me like before, to be together, but in passing. Ah, oh, how can I be without you, my life? You yourself tell me if I can. And while saying this, I burst into tears. And Jesus, pressing me to himself, told me, Poor daughter of mine, poor daughter of mine, courage! Your Jesus does not leave you, nor should you fear that you might go out of my will, because your will is chained to the immutability of mine. At most it might be thoughts, impressions that you will feel, but not true acts. In fact, since the immutability of my will is in you, when yours might be about to go out of mine, you will feel the firmness, the strength of my immutability and will remain more chained to it. And besides, have you forgotten that I am not only in your heart, but in the whole world, and that from within you I direct the destiny of all creatures? What you feel is nothing other than the way the world is with me, and the pains they give me. Since I am in you, they are reflected upon you. Ah, my daughter, how much does the world give us to suffer? But come, courage, when I see that you can take no more, I leave everything and I come to be with my daughter, 
to cheer you and to cheer myself from the pains they give me. Having said this, he disappeared. I was left strengthened, yes, but with such melancholy as to feel myself dying. I felt as though soaked in a bath of bitternesses and afflictions, so much so that I did not feel the strength to say to Jesus, Come. Then, while I was doing my usual prayers, my beloved Jesus came back telling me, My daughter, tell me, why are you so melancholic? See, I come from the midst of creatures with tears in my eyes, my heart pierced, betrayed by many. And so I said to myself, Let me go to my daughter, to my little newborn of my will, that she may dry my tears. With her acts that she has done in my will, she will give me the love and everything that the others do not give me. I will rest in her, and I will cheer her with my presence. And you, instead, let yourself be found as so melancholic that I have to put my pains aside in order to relieve yours? Don't you know that cheerfulness for the soul is like fragrance for flowers, like condiment for foods, like the skin tone for people, like maturation for fruits? like the sun for plants. So with this melancholy you have not let me find a fragrance that may cheer me, nor a tasty food, nor a mature fruit. Rather you are all fated as to move me to pity. Poor daughter, courage, cling to me, do not fear. I clung to him. I would have wanted to burst into tears. I felt my voice being suffocated. But I plucked up strength, I repressed my tears, and I said to him, Jesus, my love, my pains are nothing compared to yours. So let us think about your pains if you don't want to add more bitternesses to mine. Let me dry your tears and let me share in the pains of your heart. So he shared his pains with me, and while letting me see the grave evils present in the world and those which will come, he disappeared from me. February 5, 1928, Volume 23 Promise in Eden of the Future Redeemer Solemn Promise in the Our Father of the Kingdom of the Divine Will How God Feels the Joy of Creation Being Repeated My poor mind feels as though fixed in the supreme fiat, and I feel like a little girl who, since she likes the beautiful lessons of her beloved teacher, always hangs around her, asking her a thousand questions, to have the pleasure of hearing her speak and of learning new, more beautiful lessons. And while the teacher speaks, she remains there with her mouth open, listening to her, so many are the beautiful surprises that she gives her with her lessons. Such am I, a tiny little one, hanging around the light of the divine will, more than teacher, wanting to draw its life from the beautiful lessons it gives to my little soul. And because I am little, it delights in making me content, giving me such surprises of divine lessons never thought of by me. So while I was thinking about the kingdom of the divine will, and its reigning upon earth seemed as though difficult to me, my beloved Jesus, coming out from within my interior, told me, My daughter, as Adam sinned, God made him the promise of the future Redeemer. Centuries passed, but the promise did not fail, and the generations had the good of redemption. Now as I came from heaven and formed the kingdom of redemption, before departing for heaven I made another promise, more solemn, of the kingdom of my will. And this was in the Our Father. And so as to give it more value, and to obtain it more quickly, I made this formal promise in the solemnity of my prayer, praying the Father to let his kingdom come, which is the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. I placed my very self at the head of this prayer, knowing that such was his will, and that prayed by me, he would deny me nothing. 
more so since I prayed with his very will, and I asked for something that was wanted by my father himself. And after I had formed this prayer before my celestial father, certain that the kingdom of my divine will upon earth would be granted to me, I taught it to my apostles, that they might teach it to the whole world, so that one might be the cry of all, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A promise more sure and solemn I could not make. Centuries are like one single point for us, but our words are accomplished acts and facts. My very praying to the Celestial Father, let it come, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, meant that with my coming upon earth, the kingdom of my will was not established in the midst of creatures. Otherwise I would have said, My Father, let our kingdom that I have already established on earth be confirmed and let our will dominate and reign. Instead I said, let it come. This meant that it must come, and creatures must await it with that certainty with which they awaited the future Redeemer, because there is my divine will, bound and committed in those words of the Our Father. And when it binds itself, whatever it promises is more than certain, more so since everything was prepared by me. Nothing else was needed but the manifestation of my kingdom, and this I am doing. Do you think that my giving you so many truths about my fiat is only to give you simple news? No, no, it is because I want everyone to know that its kingdom is near, and to know its beautiful prerogatives, so that all may love, may yearn to enter, to live in a kingdom so holy, full of happiness and of all goods. Therefore what seems difficult to you is easy for the power of our fiat, because it knows how to remove all difficulties and to conquer everything, the way it wants and when it wants. Then I was doing my round in the eternal fiat according to my usual way, and going around throughout the whole creation, I was bringing all works before the divinity, to give to it the most beautiful homage and the great glory of all their works. But while I was doing this, I thought to myself, but what is the glory I give to my Creator by bringing him all his works? And Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, my daughter, by doing so, you bring to us the joy of our accomplished works. In fact, before we created the creation, they were inside of us, as though in deposit in our will, and we did not have the glory, the joy of seeing our works outside of ourselves, formed and accomplished outside of us. So our works were formed when the creation was created, and if one goes around in their midst, looks at them, and wanting to gather them all together around us, says to us, how beautiful are your works, perfect and holy, their harmony, their perfect order tell who you are and narrate your glory. We feel the joy, the glory being repeated, as if we were again extending the heavens, forming the sun and all our works. So the creation remains always in act and as though speaking by means of the little daughter of our will. This can happen to you also. If you had decided in your will to make many beautiful works you did not enjoy, but your joy begins when you see the works accomplished. And if someone loving you often brought them around you to say to you, see how beautiful are your works, would you not feel glorious and the joy of when you accomplished them being repeated? Such am I. The repetitions form my most beautiful surprises. End of February 5th Fiat, 